Hello there. Well, I've already taken a look at a film, an anime, a trading card series, and a girl group spin-off movie. Now let's take a look at the rich and graphically diverse world of video games. And as you can tell from that box behind me, it's not going to be any of your current PlayStation or Xbox stuff here. No, we're going back to the late 80s through to the mid 90s for this console, the glory days of this, the Sega Mega Drive. Or if you're in North America, the Genesis. Uh, always got to be different, eh? Well, that's okay, I don't mind the name Genesis, but Mega Drive is the name I will be using. And, because it's the first day of the month, I'll play through one game every day. And it's April, which has 30 days, and gives me a handy title for this exercise. Still, enough talk, let's stick the old cartridge in and get into it. This is 30 Games in 30 Days. Okay, so I'm going in alphabetical order, and it's fitting that Altered Beast is first, because it was the first Mega Drive game I saw, played, and owned, being the one you got free when you purchased the console at that time. I can remember being impressed by the sampled speech, and that you didn't have to wait for games to load, being that I'd only played games on computers until that time. While the game didn't hook me in, the console did, and sure enough, the following years produced platform beat-em-ups that were much more challenging, addictive, and nuanced than this half-baked rubbish. Still, it was a good enough arcade conversion, and not bad as a freebie, even if you can clock it in under 15 minutes. Oh, and can I say what cheapskates Sega were in Australia? Our game manuals were not stapled colour booklets, but fold-out monochrome ones. And in my case, not even for the correct console. My Altered Beast manual was for the Master System version. The title character in this platformer by Virgin was the mascot for Soft Drink 7-Up, but I didn't know that at the time, even though my dad worked for Pepsi Cola. Mainly because here in Australia, the 7-Up mascot was a simplistically cartooned 80s frizzy-haired dude called Fido Dido not a sunglasses-wearing red spot with typically oversized 90s high tops. Fido Dido did have his own game, which I've never played, but Dave Perry did cool spots, so that's reason enough to check this out, right? The game never came across to me as a 7-Up marketing vehicle. Even though large green bottles are in plain sight, the 7-Up logo is nowhere near as prominent. Nothing like the overkill that the Penguin Biscuits logo got in James Pond, or the Chupa Chups logo in Zool. Even if it was, at least there's a decent game to back it up. Very challenging, and many humorous touches. Lots to see and do on screen. Responsive, and only let down by the repetition of certain levels. If you'll forgive my choice of adjective, this is a pretty cool game. This whole notion of being cool reached an apex in the early 90s. Geek chic and nerd cool were a few years off in the future, the looming internet years, and there was no room for those who wore their geekdom with pride, in the mass entertainment arena at least. Everyone wanted to be cool in that era. Some earned their cool, like the Street Fighter characters. Some were cool from the get-go, like Sonic. Some were shamelessly touted as cool, and yet were painfully uncool, like Awesome Possum. And the spot? While I seriously doubt that a red disc can have the personality and style of a fast blue hedgehog or a rocket-powered opossum, he's a pleasant enough little guy. But soon, Dave Perry would be working on a mold-breaking game starring a certain gun-toting earthworm, who, as you'll see, definitely was cool. If you're only going to play one MD pinball sim, it has to be this one. Just as FIFA is the benchmark for all football sims, and Street Fighter 2 for one-on-one -on -one beat -em ups Devil Crash, known as Dragon's Fury outside of Japan, is the epitome of 16-bit satanic hell-related demon spawn-themed pinball games. So while you're twanging about like a duffer, you can at least enjoy the antics of hobbling hunchbacks, deformed insectoids, scaly lizards, and other wizened weirdos trundling about awaiting their demise at the touch of your silver ball. Addictive stuff. 
Even without the hell theme of the graphics, this is one classic and definitive pinball sim. Great effects, smooth ball movement, and endless sadistic minions to destroy. Not even its own sequel, the rubbishy Dragon's Revenge, could match it. Plain Clothes Tracy, the private dick who starred in several mediocre side-scrolling platform shoot-em-ups, now finds himself in this unique play method I don't think was used anywhere else, using a pistol for close-range enemies and a Tommy gun for the thugs in the background. His objective is simple. All he has to do is dodder along the street, blasting away like a lunatic. Three or four hits and he gets smoked, and you get to chuckle at the comical sight of his yellow hat fluttering down to the ground to join his bullet-ridden body. Okay, shameful confession time. When I was in year 11, I got into the habit of playing this every morning and was frequently late for school because of it. And yet, despite buying this game over 20 years ago, I still have never finished it or reached the final level. Sad. To put it straight, this game's a pie of shit. A lot of times you just can't avoid getting shot. Because Dick trudges along at snail's pace, you're reduced to inching along firing both guns like a freakazoid. The enemies are all morons, endlessly repeating their attacks. But unless you draw them out to an area where you can nail them, they'll frag Dick's pitiful ass in seconds. Repetitious and boring this game may be, but somehow it's also oddly addictive. Bizarre, I know. I've got nothing here, sorry. Earthworm Jim. What can I say about this except one of the best games ever made? Jim is one of my favourite character creations. He's tough, he's funny, he's stylish, and he isn't contrived in any way. No sap has sat around trying to milk 90s kids of their cash with some phony quote-unquote hero. No, Jim is instead the end result of talented and witty programmers that make sure their software excels in all areas, putting most platformers to shame. Even the platform game tag doesn't necessarily fit here. This is more of an experience, each level calling for new skills. There's a reason there's no scoring system in this game. Get to the end, rescue Princess What's-Her-Name, that's your objective. Jim's personality comes through even when you leave him standing still. He'll sing for you, spin his gun on his finger, or accidentally shoot himself in the face. And considering you'll rarely leave him still, it just shows how much thought and humour Shiny put into developing their megastar. Every one of Jim's nemeses has their own quirks as well. There's so much packed into this game, it'll keep you going for ages. If you've got it, go play it. If not, go get it. And then you and Jim can go out and conquer the universe. Would you believe that since I first played Echo some 21 years ago, that this is the first time I've played it in colour? You see, for the first year I owned my Mega Drive, and before I got my own TV, I had to play my games on my family's late 70s wood-panelled Mitsubishi TV set, which incidentally lasted a good 25 years. And yes, that's Mitsubishi as in the car company. But long-lasting as their TVs were, they couldn't display console games in colour. Not a single one except for some reason the third level of Strider. Well, anyway, I borrowed this off a friend sometime in the first half of 1993. He'd handily written the level passwords in the manual, but because I only had the game for a week or so, I didn't get to invest much mental energy in it and appreciate its true depth, pardon the pun. 
for this is an exploration game which requires puzzling and forming strategies that only comes with hours upon hours of solid play. It's definitely a game that exercises the brain. And to finally see it in colour? Well, it still looks amazing even now, but one thing I can't do now, which I could do in 1993, is listen to the sound through a stereo. You have to do this to fully appreciate this game's soundtrack. The Mega Drive featured many football sims, some good like the original FIFA, Super Kickoff and J-League, some mediocre trash like Striker and World Cup USA 94, but since FIFA 96 is the only one I actually owned, I'll go with this one. It's the sequel to FIFA 95, which was an update of the original FIFA International Soccer title from 1994. There hasn't been much left out of this third instalment. Better graphics, better sound, on-screen clock, and a whole host of play options. You can create fantasy leagues, disable the offside rule, transfer players to existing teams, and save strategies. But the biggest improvement is in the offensive moves. Scrimmages, shootouts, breakaways, smarter players, more aggressive goalies. The animation is excellent, and just about every move from real soccer is in here. The only negative is that, well, I'm not all that good at it. Gunstar Heroes by Treasure, their debut game. I'm sorry I had nothing to say about Dynamite Heady before, which came out a year later. I actually really like the graphical style for its off-the-wall craziness. But Gunstar Heroes, to my mind, probably has a slight edge on it. I can't really say why. There's a lot going on on screen, perhaps too much at times. I like Treasure's dense and chunky graphical style, and they never fail to make use of the full palette of colours. And oh yeah, I don't have a clue what I'm doing here. For the last 20 years, I've been calling this game Gynoog, only to find out just a few days ago when preparing this video that it's pronounced Jinoog, if the Japanese title is anything to go by, and it usually is. Huh? Well, this is a grim game, very dark visuals, with the exception of the bright pink fifth brain level, and as the huge behemoths surge around dealing death, your little flying man farts around the screen, dying on contact with walls. The main sprite is exceptionally sad. He's too small and at times gets camouflaged by the dingy backdrops. He really is crap. While some of the bosses are so big, they can't fit on the screen. Anyway, I've spent many an hour playing this, and I think the normal bullets are more effective than all those lame-o magic spells that only last a few seconds anyway. At least blowing stuff up is satisfying. Now will someone please tell me what Jinogue means?